one zero. Hello, my name is Daniel Hodab, and I'm a facilitator of the Law of One Telegram Europe group. And today we are having our study group together again with Gabriel Lugo and discussing about session number four. Welcome, Gabriel. Thank you, Daniel. Um, we have session four, as you said today. Um, and this session is actually comprised of, I would say, two main parts, which is, again, a leftover of pyramids, and then we go into healing, which is really, as you know, what I'm interested in, just that practical part of it. And pyramids being just kind of like information that is not that important for our inner work, and yet it's interesting information. So as I always say, if anybody wants to talk about this, we can go into it and possibly uh, shed some light or share some ideas as to what happened here. Um, but I would prefer to concentrate, of course, on the healing side, which is what derives out of this, the mechanisms of the pyramid, as we found out in session three and possibly in session two. I can't remember now, but we already talked about the purposes of the pyramids being this initiation and healing and yeah, in essence, just uh, becoming somebody who walks the law of one in, in short. Several things that I find extremely important and interesting to, to share in this session. Uh, but of course, we have over 20 exchanges between Don and Ra. And I will skip some of those. I'll just highlight the things that are important in, uh, in certain questions. And then we'll move on. So we're going to begin with the second question. Second question being um, about pyramids. And so here, and I won't read the whole exchange, but there's something interesting that for the people, is Josh here? Josh is not here, right? So Josh would probably be able to explain this better than I do. Uh, but they, they talk about the geometry of the pyramid and where is that plane located where uh, healing or initiation, I'm not sure which of the two uh, happens. I think it was the healing point, yeah. Um, and it has to be with geometry. I'm not skillful enough with words to make you visualize this, but if you take the, the size of the pyramids and you kind of create like uh, different triangles within every phase and then connect to the opposite vertices. In short, it creates a sort of diamond shape inside the pyramid. And so there is a plane in there in which there is um, there is the place for healing. That's where the energies are concentrating the most. In my limited view, I can imagine that this diamond shape is, in essence, that spiral that comes up and at some point it intensifies, as Ryan describes later in session, I want to say in the 50s or so, when they talk about pyramids again to, into, uh, into more depth. So that's what uh, question two is about. They're just talking about this, this midpoint in, uh, in the plane of the pyramid. Uh, again, interesting stuff for those who, um, who like this. I I did find really, I mean, just to admire Don's intellect and capacity for visualization is that remember that we are reading this and Don was listening at the moment and he was able to, you know, answer. As I understand that the initiate wants to be in the center of, in the center line of the pyramid, but at an altitude above the base as defined by the, by the intersection of the four triangles made by dividing each side of the four triangles. Is that correct? And Ross says that that is correct. I just found it super impressive that Don was able to read all of this from Ra, visualize it, and then, you know, just confirm it. But then again, Don was a, um, I think he had a bachelor's in science and mechanical engineer or something like that. He was a physicist in essence. So he did say at some point in the raw material that he was, because of his training, it was easy for him to visualize geometry or three-dimensional shapes. 
when they were talking about visualization and meditation and so on. So I don't know. I just found that interesting part of the historical background of Don and the capacity for just being able to keep up keep up with Ra's answers. That's just descriptive of you know this trio that was just perfectly tuned for this. So yeah, much love to 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 Don. Um, I'm moving into question five now to keep talking about pyramids. Um, the size of the pyramid is what they discuss here. A couple of things. Um, uh, I think here is where they, yes. So Ra, in terms of the size of the pyramid, they say that, of course, to for the purpose of initiation, the pyramid needs to be big enough for people to be inside the pyramid and be able to be bathed in this, these energies. So they'll be able to go through, you know, the, uh, I guess the effect, the impact that these energies would have to uh, cause the, um, the distortion or to eliminate the distortion, depending on how you want to use the word, but basically to see what they had to see to reflect themselves as uh, as initiation and healing. I'm not sure how that would work. I'm trying to describe something that people have trouble, I guess, with uh, explaining a psychedelic trip or something like that. I'm in my limited understanding. It just feels like something like that. It's an experience in which you're seeing with more clarity. And again, how you direct that clarity, it also depends on the healer who's there with you and so on. Uh, but all of that was necessary uh, within the pyramid. And they talk about also a small size pyramid, I think, that if you can place it below a body or above, I have one here. I don't know if these are the dimensions, but like this small pyramid still creates a uh, kind of, um, and again, I'm not sure that these are the ratios. They possibly are, but this is still kind of funneling the prana, the energy of, of the planets and creating the same, um, the same spiral. It's just that I don't fit there. <laughs> and I think there's a part where Ross says, you know, you should be careful not to put, I don't know if they say, it, but we can extrapolate that no animals can, and can enter there. Um, like an insect or something. But yeah, that's um, they talk a little bit about that, about a tiny pyramid that can be placed below a body or above a body and have a specific effect. So that's question five. In question six, they talk about the pyramid being out of tune <clears throat> because the energy of the planets, the energies of the planet have shifted. And uh, they also say, which is interesting, in the pyramid, there's still remnants of the distortions of those who, in essence, use this pyramid for the wrong reasons, let's say, without being moralistic. Just they use it for, uh, what do they call it? Less than compassionate, for less compassionate purposes. So not only are the energies of the planet, I guess the spirals of the energy, uh, the spiral energies of the planet have changed, have shifted. We know that this is happening, especially now with four density um, rising and being funneled into the planet. So not only is that energy not in tune with the pyramid, but also the distortions of which I would say that the, those are not long lasting distortions. I think it's very similar to the ritual cleansing that Ra talked about later on in the final sessions. Because these are just remnants of the distortions of the people who were there and doing these less compassionate things with the pyramid. 4.7, they, they talk about building requirements for the pyramids. Don is asking if it would be possible to build the pyramids. Uh, we can see Don going now into the question of can we build a pyramid and maybe use it as you used to do it? And we can see Ra going straight into, no, let's not build more pyramids. Let's direct this to inner work. And you'll see that reflected in the session. Uh, but yeah, in this question, Don is asking about the, the building of the new pyramids and the requirements for initiation. 
And we're going to read some of that in the next question. Um, because that's th these are the ones that I'm, I'm interested in reading. So we're going to begin reading now. Okay. So again, with this line of question, Don is asking basically, can we build a, a pyramid? Um, and we'll go to that. So 4.8 is the first one that I'm going to read completely. Because here's where we start to get um, the essence of the session. So my question then would be, are there individuals incarnate upon the planet today who would have the necessary inner disciplines to, using your instructions, construct and initiate in a pyramid they built and then possibly do it again? Is this within the limits of what anyone can do on the planet today? Or is there no one available for this? Now, here's the twist that I see. I guess from my point of view, I see Don asking, Hmm. Is it possible for us to build a pyramid and, you know, correct basically what we did wrong and now do it right? Do we have people that can do this? And so instead of looking from this way, Ra turns it around and says, actually, you don't need the pyramids. You will go, you know, you already have the purity to do this work. So here's what they say. They say, there are people, as you call them, who are able to take this calling at this nexus. However, we wish to point out once again that the time of the pyramids, as you would call it, is past. It is indeed a timeless structure. However, the streamings from the universe were, at the time we attempted to aid this planet, those which required a certain understanding of purity. This understanding has, as the streamings revolve and all things evolve, changed to a more enlightened view of purity. Thus, there are those among your people at this time whose purity is already one with intelligent infinity. Without the use of structures, healer patient can gain healing. This is the answer in which Ra says, pyramids are obsolete. We don't need them. Things have evolved. Humans are not as... Um, humans... <laughs> Can I use the word dumb? We're not as dumb as we used to. We're not as unevolved as we think we are. There's a level of purity that we have achieved and it's available. Um, I like to think that there is not one individual who is particularly you know, more enlightened than the other, which I don't believe actually, um, but rather that the purity of understanding this over time because of this contribution of thousands of years that we have gone through meditation and prayer and contemplation and knowledge of self that has created this um this this resource this available resource for us to tap into so everybody's able to tap into this in other words it's almost like humanity has evolved together yes we've had some wars and some genocides and some you know, um, less than compassionate things over history, but we have also collectively contributed to this database or this resource. And so every one of us, we just need the will to go into it. We're able to tap into that. In other words, people like Buddha, Jesus, and others, they contributed to this database so we can all tap into it easily or easier than before. That's how I see it. Uh, but there are indeed, you know, people who are more, uh, in tune with this than others. And that's just the factor of, you know, uh, variety in our minds. So I thought that was really interesting because we're going to move into that. We're going to move into self-healing. We don't need structures. We don't even need another healer, although it's helpful. Uh, and I wish today um, Morris and Linda were here because they could probably elaborate more on this. But this is what we got. So yeah, the time of the pyramids is past and there is a more enlightened state available for everybody. And like I said, it's a resource of Mother Gaia, if you want to see it this way, the Akashic record, the collective consciousness, or simply the awareness of the planet. It has this available. We just need to direct our attention there. And we'll talk about that. Um, so moving on to question nine. 
this is the evolution of healer and healing I have here. I don't remember why I put that. Oh, yes, this is, can we, I'm going to read it. It's pretty short. Don is asking, is it possible for you to instruct healing techniques if we could make available these individuals that have the native ability? So again, Don is taking it, of course, you know, can we train a healer into this? And, you know, Ra says it is possible. Um, they say, we must add that many systems of teach learning and healing patient nexus are proper given various mind-body-spirit complexes. We ask your imagination to consider the relative, the relative simplicity of the mind in the early cycle and the less distorted but often overly complex views and thought spirit processes of the same mind body spirit complexes after many incarnations i want to talk about this a little bit because it's kind of entangled and sounds complex um so ross says it is possible obviously to train somebody in healing but they're also bringing don's mind to consider the fact that um, there are many ways in which healing can happen. It's not necessarily, you know, the ultimate structure. The pyramid is the ultimate structure or substances or anything else for that matter, or a technique or a particular method or practice. There are just various ways into, you know, healing. And in the next question, there's one part that I'll, it's going to hit my heart. But the other thing is also to consider the fact that we have evolved. It, this part sounds a little bit complicated when they say, uh, we ask your imagination to consider the relative simplicity of the mind in the early cycle. So in the early cycle at the beginning, when we were a lot more primitive, the simplicity of our minds were just you know, basic needs and not much complexity of society and everything that we have right now. I mean, even now we know that we have accelerated this um, the amount of things that we have to attend to. And so we have created in psychology a term that I don't like much, which is the uh, ADHD and um, things like a pathology. It isn't. Uh, it's just the capacity that people have for attending various things. And well, they seem to be in disorder, but that's a, that's a strength rather than a weakness. And it should be highlighted as that. So it, it is more overly complex now and that's because we have evolved. Um, in the last paragraph, they're just talking about how we can we can conceive the fact that other wanderers, in this case, have come into this planet and brought with them their their skills and understandings. So that's also in the collective pool of knowledge of of accessibility, if you will. That's one of the things that Ra describes wanderers as bringing in. Yes, you're living your life, but what you brought within your mind complex is also, it's almost like it's injecting or uh, fusing itself with the collective consciousness. And yeah, you know, we can imagine many ways in which, you know, this, this can be visualized. The wonders, I mean. This one I'm going to read fully, and I'll talk more about this. Um, this is question 10, and Don says, I would very much like to continue investigation into the possibility of this healing process. I love it. See, Don is going in the right direction. But I'm a little lost as to where to begin. Can you tell me what my first step would be? So we're talking about healing now. Of course, Ra says, I cannot tell you what to ask. I may suggest that you consider the somewhat complex information just given and thus discover several avenues of inquiry. So consider everything we have said to you and just formulate your questions based on that. Here's the love, the part that I love and that hits my heart. Ra said, there is one health, and this is in quotes, thanks to Jim, I would assume, to highlight it. There is one health, as you call it, in your polarized environment, but there are several significantly various distortions of types of mind-body-spirit complexes. Each type must pursue its own learned teaching in this area. Now, I want you to take away everything else that may be clouding your mind or distracting or coloring it. And just focus on this one health. There is only one health. 
this health refers to the recognition of who you are. There is no biggest reform, transformation, transmutation. There is no word that we use positively in the, in, in the spiritual path that is stronger than realizing that you are the creator. Everything else revolves around that. So there's only one health. And that's where everything leads to. Our health is to remember who we are and live from there. The reason why I'm so um, emphatic about this is because there is nothing else that compares to that. One health means that. And like I pointed out in the last session, I, our last session, and in the last session of the Law of One, I pointed that Ra, whenever they say healing health or pain regarding you know, ailment and so on, they always say, as you would call it, right? Because we have a view of health or healing that has to do a lot with the body. Yeah, maybe some with the mind, but it has a lot, a lot to do with the body. So healing actually is just you realizing what you are and living from there. It's not enough to just think about it intellectually and say, yes, I know I'm one. I am the creator. What else? There is no what else. That's it. Why are you complaining? Why are you still confused? <laughs> you know, uh, the confusion and the complaining comes from just realizing, okay, I, there is still some uh, something going on um, that clouds my judgment. I still don't believe that I am. In fact, I still don't know that I am. So that part to me was excellent when they say there is only one health. And then, of course, they say that there are, there are several um, types of people, basically. Um, there are several types of people. And every one of us needs to find their own way of healing, in essence. What avenue of healing are we, are we looking for? And we all resonate with different practices or ways to to see the self as the creator. But that's the ultimate point. There's nothing beyond that. There's nothing above. There's nothing superior to. All is at the realization of one. That's where everything ends and begins. As Ra says, always begin and end with the creator, not in technique. I'm going to skip over several of this, but I will talk about what they, they're saying. So from 411 to 412, they're just talking about finding a person that could be trained as a healer. Um, I won't be reading that, but Don was interested in getting somebody who, uh, who could have done the healing or trained for healing and all that. That goes actually into question 13, doesn't it? Yes. Um, actually, I'll comment on this one because Don is asking if... Um, actually, 13 and 14, if you read, if you read them, Ra is... Uh, let me read it so it's not in the air. 13 and 14. Let's do this. In terms of finding an individual who can train for healing, yes... Um, and this is this is interesting because we're getting to see how we don't need a healer at this point. We could, and we'll see what a healer is. And I'll give you a very simplistic example, which really is healing at any case. Um, but yeah, Don says, I'm assuming then that the select individual would in necessarily be one who was very much in, in harmony with the law of one though he may not have any intellectual understanding of it, he should be living the law of one. Is this correct? So with the healer, the person who is going to train as a healer, should he be living the law of one? Uh, Ross says this is both correct and incorrect. The first case, that being correctness, would apply to one such as the questionnaire, or done, itself, who has the distortion towards healing, as you call it. 
The incorrectness, which shall be observed, is the healing of those whose activities in your space-time illusion do not reflect the law of one, but whose ability have, has found its pathway to intelligent infinity, regardless of the plane of existence from which this distortion is found. Uh, Don didn't understand this and asked again for clarification. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to explain it yet. So I'll, I'll fill it up with more of Ra's answer. And they say, well, we can restate that in many ways. Given this insurance knowledge of your vibratory sound complexes, meaning Carla being able to um, utter many English words because Carla was had a huge vocabulary. Uh, and they basically go back to saying, two kinds there are who can heal. Those such as yourself, Don, who having the innate distortion towards knowledge given of the law of one, can heal, but do not. And those who, having the same knowledge, but showing no significant distortion consciously towards the law of one in mind, body, or spirit, yet and nevertheless have opened a channel to the same ability. The point being that there are those who, without proper training, shall we say, nevertheless heal. So there are two types. The first one is those who, like Don and many others, who seek honestly, directly, um, humbly into the law of one, which, again, I want to rephrase that the law of one is simply unity consciousness, our true being, Christ consciousness. We have many names for that. But... It's just going to this understanding that what we are is, in essence, one being. And many things derive from here. So those there are who do not heal, right? Apparently, we do not heal, but there is the, there's a little twist here that I'll talk about. Uh, but as a healer, per se, that does healing, I guess, there is, uh, many there are who are have this distortion, like Don, but we, we're not interested in that specific service. And there are others who have opened the channel to intelligent infinity and they're able to heal, but they don't follow the law of one, not this book or Ra's teaching, but you know what I mean? The recognition of oneness. Does that sound like we know people like that? Or we have known of people like that? Yes, we have. There's a lot of people who um, do this type of work and they're not, their lives do not reflect what they are, they are giving, what their service is. That's what they're referring to. And they keep saying, it is a further item of interest that those whose life does not equal their work, so these people, may find some difficulty in, in absorbing the energy of intelligent infinity and thus become quite distorted in such a way as to cause disharmony in themselves and others, and perhaps even find it necessary to seize the healing activity. Therefore, those of the first type, those who seek to serve and are willing to be trained in thought, word, and action, are those who will be able to comfortably maintain the distortion towards service in the area of healing. This is nothing shocking, of course, if you are inherently destabilized and you have many issues with yourself and yet, for some reason, you have this psychic power, as some people call it. You will still distort yourself greatly and others. That's just the nature of it. Whereas those who take the path humbly and are able just to express whatever they can, that seems a lot more sustainable. Um, and of course, this path leads to great service and healing for those who are interested in that uh, avenue of service. So interesting note there, just, just so you can see the types of healers that can exist. So 4, 15, and 16 will be about training. Can you train us? Ross says, yes, we will train you if you want. Uh, 4, 17. I'm going to read. Am I going to read this? Sure, why not? So Don says, I have no idea of how long this would take or if you can even tell anything about that. Is it possible for you to give me a synopsis of the program of training required? I have no knowledge of what questions to ask at this point. 
I'll ask that qu the question or that question in the hopes that it makes sense. Ra says, we consider your request for information for, as you noted, there are a significant number of vibratory sound complexes which can be used in sequence to train the healer. So in other words, we can explain healing in many ways, and we will. The synopsis is a very appropriate entry that you might understand what is involved. Firstly, the mind must be known to itself, as we heard in the past sessions. This is perhaps the most demanding part of healing work. If the mind knows itself, then the most important aspect of healing has occurred. For consciousness is the microcosm of the law of one. So here's the most important part. The mind must know itself. Know yourself, accept yourself, become the creator. The second part has to do with the disciplines of the body complexes. In the streamings reaching your planet at this time, these understandings and disciplines have to do with the balance between love and wisdom in the use of the body in its natural functions. So body comes next. We heard this too in terms of the pyramid that the mind must be initiated first before the body will be known and that's reflected here. The third area is the spiritual and in this area, the first two disciplines are connected through the attainment of contact with intelligent infinity. So three steps for healing and to become a healer, of course, because once you're healed, uh, healing is just a natural state for you. You just naturally heal. Um, if you decide to do it more consciously, of course, and as a service, then that's fine. And if you don't, that's fine as well. Um, so here, here's, I think there's a little bit more, um, Don says that he understands in essence, the, the general idea and the first step, but can he elaborate or Ra elaborate on the other two steps? So body and spirit. Ra says, imagine the body, imagine the more dense aspects of the body. So our physical dense gross body. Proceed therefrom from the very finest knowledge of energy pathways, which revolve and cause the body to be energized. So energy centers. Um, understand that all natural functions of the body have all aspects from dense to fine and can be transmuted to what you may call sacramental. This is a brief investigation of the second area. So the body must be understood. The needs of the body. What is it that you want? What is it that the body requires? And understanding from the gross, dense uh, requirements of the body to the finest, which is perceived more as mental, right? The reason why I do this, the reason why I require this, the reason it's a more holistic understanding of the body, not as a physical thing, but as related to energy centers and my mental distortions and what do I repress, what do I don't. That's healing. That's in essence, accepting your body as it is, the manifestation of your body. To speak to the third, imagine, if you will, the function of the magnets, right? We're talking about spirit now. The magnet has two poles. One reaches up, other goes down. Prana goes up, awareness comes down. The function of the spirit is to integrate the upreaching yearning of the mind-body energy Right? That's the one that's going up with the downpouring in streaming of infinite intelligence. This is a brief explication of the third area. So <laughs> in one single paragraph, after talking about Kundalini, contact with intelligent infinity, and allowing, in essence, this acceptance and uh, everything that happens in our inner work, which is an alignment of energy centers, unblocking, and so on. I know I'm going through a lot of stuff that we could, you know, branch out, but um, I just wanted to throw that in there. That's why the raw material is just a constant studying. This is not something that we can just read and say, yeah, I read it. I got it. Uh, you can continue to read it because your understanding keeps enhancing and you can see even more things. Um, I say that from experience and um, yeah, it's, um, it's a beauty. Let's read this one too. 
is question 19. Don says, then would this training program involve specific things to do, specific instructions and exercises? So Ross says, we are not at this time incarnates among our peoples. <laughs> Does we, we can guide and attempt and attempt to specify, but cannot, for example, show. This is a handicap. However, there should be there should indeed be fairly specific exercises of mind, body, and spirit during the teach learning process we offer. So we may be able to give you some of these exercises. I don't think they ever did, or maybe I'm missing something. It is to be once again iterated that healing is but one distortion of the law of one. Mm, that's beautiful. To reach an undistorted understanding of that law, it is not necessary to heal or indeed to show any manifestation, but only to exercise the disciplines of understanding. Of understanding. Very powerful there, because we've been talking about healing. And some of us may think, well, I need to heal a lot to get to this understanding. Eventually, I'll get there. Well, let's pop that bubble and say, as Ross said, healing is but one distortion of the law of one. I repeat that. Healing is but one distortion of the law of one. To reach an undistorted understanding of that law, it is not necessary to heal. To show any manifestation or indeed to show any manifestation, but only to exercise the disciplines of understanding. One is the biggest understanding, like I said. Who are you? What truly are you? Why do we skip that part in favor of some other physical and mental practice? Always, always go back to the simplicity of self-knowledge. That's the practice. Four twenty. Four twenty is actually one of my favorites, um, and that's not a code for anybody who understands that. Uh, I always have to make that joke. There are people out there. So, in question twenty, Don says, "My objective is primarily to discover more of the law of one, and it would be very helpful to discover techniques of healing." I am aware of your problem with respect to free will. Can you make no, he pauses and says, you cannot make suggestions. So I will ask if you can state the law of one and the laws of healing to me. Uh, that's why I love it. Ra says, this is one of the biggest descriptions of the law of one, by the way. The law of one, though beyond the limitations of name, as you call vibratory sound complexes, may be approximated by stating that all things are one. So... When you say all things are one, you're approximating the law of one. That there is no polarity, no right or wrong, no disharmony, but only identity. All is one, and that one is love light, like love, the infinite creator. One of the primal distortions of the law of one is that of healing. Ah, how does healing occur? They say healing occurs when a mind-body-spirit complex realizes deep within itself the law of one. That is, that there is no disharmony, no imperfection, that all is complete and whole and perfect. Thus, the intelligent infinity within the, this mind-body-spirit complex reforms the illusion of body, mind, or spirit to a form congruent with the law of one. The healer acts as an energizer or a catalyst for this completely individual process. One item which may be of interest is that a healer asking to learn must take the distortion understood as responsibility for that ask receiving, thus healing. This is an honor duty which must be carefully considered in free will before the asking. Um, if I have one thing to suggest to all of you is that you take this to heart this, this Q&A right here 
Question 20, in session four. It is one of the most beautiful answers that Ra gives. Yes, we have a lot to elaborate on energy centers, Kundalini, sexual energy transfer, and intelligent infinity, intelligent energy, the contact with intelligent infinity, gateway, and et cetera, and all these things. But this right here is the epitome to me. One, they describe the law of one. Yes, intellectually, poetically, it sounds great. And we can say, yes, I, I, I got that intellectually. But to sit with this every single day with the, with the understanding not with the intellectualization, but just with the understanding of this expression of the law of one, which is no different than any other mystical tradition in our planet. To me, that's, that's it. That's all we need. In fact, that's even more than, than we need. And then also to say that healing happens when the individual mind-body-spirit complex realizes deep within the, itself the law of one. They already describe what the law of one is. So you see when I said, all you need to do, the ultimate practice, the ultimate realization, the ultimate uh, healing or anything is just to remember who you are. And if you're still confused, then that confusion needs to be brought to the light of awareness. That is it. Because out of there, is where they say intelligent infinity within ourselves reforms the illusion of body, mind, or spirit to a form congruent with the law of one. In other words, we have an image of ourselves that is limited, separate, and in conflict, not only with the self, but with other selves. Okay, uh, This is not a judgment. This is just a generalization of the status quo of the modern society human. This is not in line with the law of one, period. It's not in line. If you have conflict with yourself and with other selves, that's not in line with the law of one. If you align yourself more and more with the law of one, that begins to inform this personality that we have created and begins to alleviate, undistort, or simply liberate those constrictions, those um, limitations that we find within ourselves and with others. This is not a complicated task. It's the most simple thing we can do. We just like to complicate it. So I would love to discuss this more than anything today. If there are some questions or comments, because that's that's the purpose of this, of these calls, to me at least. So yeah, question 20, I highly recommend that you reread and go over it. Uh, that's it. That's all we got for for today. I four twenty one in twenty two is just asking about the contact. If they can do two sessions per day, this is the first time they begin to do two sessions per day. Um, and yeah, if they're going to continue tomorrow, so um, it's almost like we scripted this. But wow, what a way to end! this session. Like I said, that's my favorite one. 420. That's it for me. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you very much. If anyone have any questions or comments, now would be the right time. Anyone have a question? Yeah, also, uh, by the way, I was also reading the uh, in the meanwhile, the, the session in the book that is uh, very helpful. Uh, Andy, you have a question. Go ahead, Andy. Yeah, I, um, oh, thank you. By the way, Gabrielle, it's really, really lovely to go through it like this as, as a group. And um, I, I actually like the format better where you're reading from the book and then I've got it open as a PDF and I'm reading along as well it it somehow makes it easier to focus and concentrate for me I don't know if it's the same with other people but um yeah because I'm not looking at the screen and switching between your screen share and, and the images so um 
yeah. Anyway, my question is about the two types of healers. I mean, for me, it seems really clear what the first type is when they say, you know, um, re refer to Don and saying like you, they can, but don't. But I still don't really understand what the second type of healer is. Yeah, so I'm going to give an example of what comes to mind. And there are people who, for example, um, who they have this ability to communicate, for example, with, um, with other entities, you know, disincarnate entities, and they're able to help others, right, with some questions that they may have and so on. These are abilities that not necessarily are reflective of spiritual progress, but rather, you know, a psychic ability. And so they may not be living the law of one per se, but they find that this is what they do. Um, and there are limits as to what they can contribute to this because, or with this, because they're not fully aligned with the law of one. And so they're, let's just put it this way, their ego can get in the way and things can get, you know, tangled up. So uh, that's the second type of healer. They're, although they have sort of made an, I don't, I don't think they use the word accidental or something like that. They just made contact with intelligent infinity and are able to draw, you know, from, from this understanding. They're not even aware of that. And again, I just don't want to make a, a stereotype, but that's the, the, the structure of it or the essence of it. People who have contact, who have a natural understanding of this, but they don't live and they're they're still sort of stuck in the sort of ego uh egoic patterns and so on um, and I, I did say thank you for asking also thank you for sharing that it was this was nice to read from the book have my notes uh, we may do this you know more in the future if that's what everybody else feels i would love to see what the group says uh, I, at the beginning, said when me and Daniel and Tad were talking about it, I said, let's see what the group actually prefers as we go through and we adapt. And I'm all, I'm, I'm fine with all of that. So I enjoy this too. Last thing I'll say before Yelena, you know, you have a question or some comments. I did say that I was going to give a simplistic example of healing, which I did in my series a couple of times. For you to understand the interaction of healing is. As simple as this, we've all had friends or family members who come to us in, in distress. And this is not, of course, there are people who come in distress and they just want to validate their worries with you and you offer them a new view and they reject it. That's also fine. You know, that's, that's okay for it to happen. People can reject healing. But somebody who has come to us, you know, in full confidence and trust and say, uh, I'm going through all of this. Uh, I just need an answer. I need you to help me out. In fact, I just had an hour ago a call with a friend who is going precisely from that, um, in that direction. And so we advise them. We tell them, you know, this is without judgment. We, we're not judging them. We're actually accepting them as they are and, you know, give them advice. We all know that sensation in them when they say, wow, man, it was just so helpful to talk to you and be able to, you know, it, it wasn't even the words that we said. It was just our capacity to reflect to them a different image. And that's what Ra suggests. I thought I read that, but I maybe it was in another session when they say that the healer simply offers a new configuration of the other entity. In other words, you're just saying, if I come to you and I say, I am so unworthy, I should never be this, I feel depressed. And you tell me, you're not unworthy. See, you're doing a reconfiguration of my image. You're telling me you're not unworthy. Look at all the things you have done, your great father, blah, 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 you know, all this stuff. Wow, you know, you impact me with that. And I say, I, I don't see myself that way, but thank you. See, that's a, that's a healing process. It's as simple as that. But of course, you know, we have many of these uh, affections and so we need we need that self-reflection with others uh, it's not fully necessary 
we don't need a healer because that's why we do inner healing and we self-reflect with ourselves but that's another story Lynn, you can ask your question now. I think Andy is just uh, busy. With yeah, and uh, thank you. I love this too because I also did uh, read uh, on my on my Kindle book uh, along which you read, you read, and I was uh, read you. So very effective. This this session for me is also most profound one because I really love to do healing work for myself or and for the other. Maybe I can take some example for the first healer and second. Uh, for the second, I can take give some example like I I did learn from an Spanish and shaman, and he was also in Australia Aboriginal forest for some time. He came back, so taught us a lot. So there's a huge community community in Germany, Austria, Switzerland. Uh, of his uh, student and later I also how to say that initiated to the Ricky many years ago but now I, I found out just to take example for Ricky in Ricky indeed is uh, as I say esoteric commercial these days quite a lot you pay 250 for level 1 500 for level 2 and uh, third level once 1,000 or 2,000, it's just ooh, initiated, okay, you are good. Then the people believe in their initiated with the magic energy they can give to you. Um, but I think uh, the love and energy is everywhere. If you have the faith and believe, say, okay, I went through the Reiki initiation, so the healers say, I have the belief, I can channel, okay. This also bring um, effect of healing but not so deep another one just like the the session four said to realize and to be the one the god with this awareness and the action and that your healing or your channel your medium work is much magic i do that before i so to say i get out of my personal i go to my divine self and I meditate all the time doing healing work, and which is indeed just love. The healing, me healing method, what I do is a reading. I'm just channeling the, the love energy. And for sure, the love is not just you channel and it's just you to live in the one, to be the love, the act, the words, the heart, the thoughts, what you are doing if you are just always try in daily life words whatever be leaving the one realize you are the one now healing is much different than just the other type two healer you know this is my example on that and also i like you said before the words the words you talk to a people is a word is magic it's like you can say positive spell or negative spell Maybe the person who you talk to, you speak to, doesn't realize that in the moment, but it's a kind of spell you, the subconscious, you know, changes. So I, I know that the words is, could be so powerful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your work, Gabriel. Yeah. Thank you. Yelena, I say Yelena because that's your name, but I hear that people call you Lynn, so... Is Lynn appropriate? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, better, shorter. Good to know. Um, if I can make a comment only on on the love side, it's beautiful because that's one thing that Ra says, right? They say that uh, the greatest healer, healing or healer, the greatest healing is love, right? And when you visualize this from the energy centers, uh, at least the way I see it, because that's another thing. Um, words, like you said. I mean, this is very close to my heart because I realized over time as I, I started studying all of this and seeing it within myself that regardless of my, my own journey in life, 
it was my preference as a friend, as somebody who knew people, it was always my preference to be there for people and engage in these conversations. So in essence, what I do right now is no different than I used to do before. And it's because it's the strongest that I have. The strongest service that I have is to, to be able to listen to somebody, to understand where they're, where they're coming from, and then be able to offer them a different image. Because it's not about the particular, it's not a cookie cutter thing, right? So you're not, um, I'm speaking from, from my side, you're only, you're only seeing that which seems correct, that which is, which is right. And the beautiful part of this process is that, or this recognition is that you don't have to make up anything for anybody. You just have to speak the truth. All you have to say is the truth of what it is. And what you find is that people are, people are more or less permeable to the truth. The truth is, is hard to, to absorb sometimes because when the truth comes with love, we're so resistant to love. And it's so difficult to accept the fact that, you know, you're doing great. Like there's nothing wrong that you're doing. To be able to, when people have issues, um, it's because they they are resisting or repressing themselves somehow in one way or another. That's it. And that means that they have, of course, a lack of self-love. So to be able to receive that love from somebody else is just so strong and say, I cannot, you know, it's hard. And so that's the, the part in which, you know, if you see it from the energy centers, it's just coming straight from truth goes to the heart and from the heart is where we heal Ra says and it makes total sense you know our words need to be informed by the heart so from here is you speak from truth and with love that's it you know th those that that's the technique if you will and it's not your technique you see it's all coming from truth you don't own the truth so you are not healing you're providing the tools for healing and the other person is able to receive that and say, well, I guess I'm not unworthy or I don't believe you. You know, I still feel that I'm unworthy and that's fine. But that configuration needs to be accepted by the other. You want to comment anything on that, Lynn? Yeah, I, because recent time, I just on the way heard the podcast from non AO research and this is the same was the said in the Shall we, we just tell them strictly what we feel, that's to be authentic indeed, which means the authentic means you don't make up, we try, but we are human, we always try to first to configure our sentence, what we're going to speak, right, we make up what we are going to speak, right, even that is a short meaning second, but we do, but in that sense, we lost the power and strength of the initiative source, which come from the source, which is of come from nature. So we make up usually, uh, usually we like to, this is our, also as a human ego later, we want to make up our sentence, you know, before we speak, you know, so, and, but this, they said it's somewhere, I, I don't know from where, from Hua or from Ra, if you just, speak straight out the nature without thinking something like that, you living in the authentic, you don't have the border. And the scene turns out much better than we try to figure out, to figure in, to, to make up our sentence, you know, to bend our initial intention to please people or please the situation, a circumstance giving that. Yeah, I. That's just. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm practicing this, this since a couple of months because I also uh, watch near death experience. You know, I love to watch all the YouTube the near death experience. The information I got in one because that day this went something bad around me, and uh, in such situation, I always love to watch the YouTube from people report their near death experience. 
but at the same day, on same day, the message always be authentic yourself. Act on that, speak on that. We feel much better. Being spontaneous. Thank you very much, Lynn. Uh, I think Andy wanted to come in once more. Please go ahead. Yeah, I think about the not thinking about what you speak. Like, usually, I don't know what I'm going to say until after I've said it. Uh, I'm not sure it works that well because usually it's like if something comes out and I'm like, Fuck, why did I say that? It's so stupid. But then it's funny as well, you know. But um, yeah, I say a lot of nonsensical things. But I, yeah, I, I don't know. I think 99% of the time it comes out and then, and then I know what I've said. But like, I, I, it, it, like it's a lot of effort to put in to think too much about what I'm going to say and I used to do a lot of public speaking um because I was as an economist I was on the sort of conference circuit and and even then I didn't really plan I kind of had like key points and then I'd sort of talk around it but it 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 feels a bit risky and sometimes I kind of think, you know, is it because I don't have self-mastery? Yes, but I think what we are talking about here, I have read it in the other book and also in the other connection, that when you are speaking, as it comes to your mind immediately without what Lynn say, considering what you say, is, uh, I think it's called it hard communication. Because uh, there yeah, is no there's much... a channel in the spirit, the inspiration, inspiration, in spirit in in the moment. Yeah, exactly. And uh, when you have that train, that pure communication, as I say, then as I hear Lynn do the same thing at the moment. I tried also with particular friends always to communicate, direct the. Uh, the thoughts, the feelings, the emotions I have during the conversation is for us not easy anymore because the society forms us in something else. But you can be trained on it again. And uh, I practice it also with uh, some friends. And uh, it's interesting what is coming out sometimes. So I fully agree with uh, what Lynn and Andy said. Yeah. So, anyone else have a question, comment, want to say something? Otherwise, we are coming to the end of our uh, session. First of all, I want to thank Gabriel for being the host of the uh, study group. And uh, by the way, I, I like it also much from reading the books, but uh, we will see how we continue in future and have a chat on it afterwards. Yeah, Gary, yeah. some closing words, maybe? Yeah, um, well, again, just going back to the uh, format that we did, if we can do this, then I'm happy to sit here and read the book. I love it. Um, I guess my final contribution is we talked about the uh, realizing the law of one within ourselves. We talk about truth. Let's skip the loving part because we don't know anything about love yet. In our journey back to self, to this truth. Everything, like I said, if we, we understand this, the law of one or any other mystical material, it just stands out as an expression of this understanding. Everything is an expression of this understanding. This understanding is knowing that you are the creator, realizing the law of one within, deep within the self, as Ra said. What is it to realize? What is this contact with intelligent infinity? If not the dissolution of the identity with the thoughts, images, and the sensations of the body, which we have. This is not something that we as entity need to do, but rather that this entity needs to relax its attention 
to its source. In other words, that which attends to the body and the mind, which is the only two things that creates form and creates manifestation or out of which manifestation is created. This identification, this relaxing of this, thinks into its source, which is pure awareness, which is intelligent infinity. Exploring that, not as a mental journey, but rather as what is, being itself. Just sinking back into being every day, at any moment, and realizing that this is not a separate part of reality. That this is simply the foundation of reality. Reality, in fact, is just one of infinite possible modulations, or as Ross says, distortions or illusions of this one infinite creator. Again, I don't want to bring this into a poetic visualization or an intellectualized image of the creator, but rather that which is always present within us, this pure awareness. And going back to it, that to me is what it is to you know, tabernacle with the creator, to stay with it. And it's not like I as an entity and going back to God or the creator. It's just that me, the entity, is dissolving. That's the highest prayer. If we go into the Christian mysticism, we see that the highest prayers are always, always directed onto the dissolution of the one who is praying. Relieve me of myself so I can be with thyself. That is the highest prayer. It's a dissolution of this. It's a recognition that all that there is is this one being. This is the one practice from which all other practices are created and are directed to. So that's why I love question 20 so much. And if I didn't say it already, I reinforce it many times just to just go back to that. There is a description of the law of one. And there is also the description of this so-called distortion of healing, which is a return in A Course in Miracles is spoken in many ways as the atonement and you know, the, the going back into uh, God. So, yeah, many words, many ways to say it. These are all simple avenues, like Ross said, of healing. But in the end, it's just one, one recognition that we do. Thank you, Daniel, for making this possible and for hosting the call.